Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Folk Athenaeum. My name is Lale Ahmed and I am one of your three Athenaeum Fellows for this year. Our speaker tonight, Reina Grande, will talk about her experiences before, during, and after crossing the US-Mexico border as an undocumented immigrant. She will discuss the many borders, real and metaphorical, that immigrants have to cross and the, and the price that families like hers have to pay for the American dream. Reina Grande humanizes an issue that has become deeply politicized and polarized today. We often talk about immigration as a transnational and global issue, and sometimes forget to talk about it in the language of love, sacrifice, and fear. Sometimes, regardless of political camp, there is a value in creating a human connection and remembering the sacrifices that our parents have made for us, our gratitude for their decisions, and what they would do in a situation that so many families across the globe are in right now. At an elite educational institution, many people are trying to navigate the pathway to the American dream and have been fortunate enough in this, to be in this situation in which higher education is accessible. Many have not, and many face systemic barriers at our institution to have access to the same experience and opportunities as their peers. Reina Grande's other works, in addition to her best-selling and critically acclaimed memoirs, The Distance Between Us and A Dream Called Home, include the novels Across a Hundred Mountains and Dancing with Butterflies. She is the recipient of the Luis Leal Award for Distinction in Chicano Latino Literature and the American Book Award and the El Premio Atzlan Literary Award, amongst others. She was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. She holds a BA and MFA in creative writing and teaches at writing conferences such as the Macondo Writers Conference and the Bread Loaf Writers Conference and the Voices of Our Nation Arts Conference. Ms. Grande's work also illuminates the value and the challenge in writing and creating narratives, especially of communities that are traditionally underrepresented in mainstream literature. Born in Mexico, Ms. Grande, was, Ms. Grande was two years old when her father left for the US to find work. Her mother followed her father north two years later, leaving Ms. Grande and her siblings behind in Mexico. In 1985, when Ms. Grande was going on 10, she entered the US as an undocumented immigrant. She later went on to become the first person in her family to graduate from college. After attending Pasadena Col City College for two years, Ms. Grande obtained a BA in creative writing and film and video from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She la later received her MFA in creative writing from Antioch University. Now, in addition to being a published author, she is also an active promoter of Latino literature and is sought after at high schools, colleges, and universities across the nation. Ms. Grande's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Claremont College's Chicano Latino Student Affairs, who are celebrating their 50-year anniversary this year, and the CMC Center for Writing and Public Discourse. As always, I must remind you to silence and put away your mobile devices at this time, and use this moment to turn your seats if you have not done, yet done so. And join me in welcoming Reina Grande to the Athenaeum. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. It's so wonderful to be here with you this evening. Um, I'm so grateful to have been invited to come to this beautiful campus. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Crockett for making that happen, for having me here. Um, I also want to dedicate this talk tonight to my siblings because they're here with me tonight. So I want to introduce them to you. Uh, my sister Mago is here, and my brother Carlos is here, and also um, my niece Alexa is here with us too. So it makes it extra special for me because um, I, I travel a lot, and, and when I get the, that chance to like just be with my family, with friends, with my readers, it just, um, to me, it's always just such a wonderful experience. So um, I'm very happy to, to be here with you tonight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, give a talk about borders and um, my, my talk is beyond borders. So we're gonna talk in a lot about borders but also going beyond those borders. And after my talk, I'm, we're gonna open it up for, for questions. So if you guys have any questions that you wanna ask me, uh, feel free to ask me anything you want. There's no right or wrong question. 
And those of us who write memoirs, we like, we're literally open books, right? So anything goes. So I'm really looking forward to, to your questions tonight. So we're talking about borders, uh, real and metaphorical borders that the Latino community and the immigrant community has to face in our daily lives. And for me, um, the borders are, are, the border is a very uh, personal topic that I love to learn more about because it really helps me to understand my own experience as a border crosser and to put my experience in the context of immigration, not just here in the US, but globally, you know, that there's so many uh, migrants and refugees all over the world. So I feel very connected to them all because um, ultimately, no matter where we're from, you know, migrant, the migrant experience is the human experience and it's a universal experience. So I came uh, face to face with the border when I was nine years old, when my father returned to Mexico to bring uh, me and my older sister and my older brother to the United States. And that is when I developed a very personal relationship with the border because when you're a border crosser, it just doesn't get more personal than that. You know, when you're coming face to face with the border, especially as a little girl, you know, I was nine years old, running for my life across this border, when at that age, I should have been running at the park chasing butterflies the way my daughter does now. But instead, I was running across the border in pursuit of a dream. And my dream was to have a family and to be able to have a shot at a better future than the one I would have had in Mexico. I risked my life for that dream. And every day that goes by, I never forget how lucky my siblings and I were when I crossed the border. You know, uh, once in a while, we hear in the news about these tragic deaths at the border. And the ones that really impacted me a lot are the deaths of children. When we see children having drowned crossing the river or children who die of dehydration in the desert, I always think about when my siblings and I were running across that border and how our stories might have ended, you know, and we could have ended as red dots on a map like this. Instead, we are here with you having dinner with you all celebrating how far we have come from that border crossing. So I'm very grateful um, to be able to, to tell my story and to, and to use this platform to speak up for my immigrant community. So four years ago, um, I celebrated my 30th anniversary of crossing the border. And I was thinking like, you know, what, do, what, what should I do? How should I celebrate? this moment, and I decided to go back to the border. I had not been to the border since I was a child, and I was really interested, interested to know what it would feel like as an adult to come and be there and see it with adult eyes. So I signed up for a border delegation through the UU College of Social Justice, and I went down to the border and we had a chance to walk around and talk to border patrol agents. Uh, we walked the migrant trails and we went to drop off water in the water stations. And we also went to the other side of the border to visit migrant shelters. And I was able to talk to migrants um, and to also learn so much about how important these migrant shelters are and, and how much they do for the migrant community and one of the things that shocked me the most when I visited the migrant shelter was when the, the father, um, the priest who runs the shelter told me that 90% of the migrants there are deportees. And, and, I, and I was really shocked to hear that. But I also thought a lot, a lot about my father, you know, and I wondered if when he made his border crossing, if there might have been a migrant shelter for him that would have given him a bed and a meal to rest during his journey. 
So it was a really empowering and, and eye-opening experience when I did that. And if you ever have the, the chance to join a border delegation, I would definitely encourage you to do so. They happen every single year. If you want more information, I'll be happy to give you more information later. But it's just a, a, a really just wonderful, wonderful way to, to get a deeper understanding of, of, the, of the border. And um, it, the border is such a complicated topic, you know, to talk about. And I, I'm not gonna say that I'm an expert on the border. I'm an expert on being an immigrant, and that's what I know, so that's how I, I talk about the border. But it's a topic that I want to know more about. Um, although, you know, recently Trump said that Latinos, more than anyone, should understand the border and the border crisis. And, and I was really interested to hear, you know, why he, he thought that. So he was at a, at a rally in New Mexico where he said, um, Latinos, uh, he said, um, you understand the border and you, should, and you should support my border wall because you understand it better than other people. At the whole center of this border crisis is the drugs that are pouring in and you understand that when other people don't understand it. And after I heard him say that, and you know, I was reading articles about the rally and, and what happened, I was thinking, um, what do Latinos understand about the border? And the more I thought about it, I realized that we definitely do understand the border better than anyone, but because we understand the border better than anyone, that is exactly the reason why we don't and we can't support his border wall. So um, these are some of the things that Latinos understand about the border crisis and the drug crisis. Um, what we understand is that the war on drugs has failed on both sides of the border. What Latinos understand is that the Latino communities here in the US and in Latin America have borne the brunt of US drug-related policies and practices. What we understand is that the guns that drug cartels use to kill innocents and intimidate communities come from the United States. What we understand is that drug addiction in the US is what's fueling the drug crisis. What we also understand is that most of the drugs entering the country are brought in through US ports of entry, not through the vast land that is the border. On a very personal level, what I understand as a border crosser is that there are already enough borders and border walls that the Latino community has to face so why would we want any more border walls? So talking about the war on drugs, which is Trump's reasoning as to why we should support his border wall, is that the drug crisis and that war on drugs has failed. Here in the United States, it has failed. It has failed in Latin America. The way that the war on drugs has failed here is that the US has really not done a very good job of reducing the drug addiction in this country. Every day, over 130 people die of drug overdose. So we are failing miserably here in the United States when it comes to our war on drugs here. But in Latin America, it's even worse. In Latin America, the war on drugs has led to rampant violence and entire communities being victimized by drug cartels. So even just in my own country in Mexico, you know, it's overrun by drug cartels. I am from the state of Guerrero, which is the southern state in Mexico. My state of Guerrero is the top source of heroin for the US drug epidemic. 
And what that means for us in our state is that that entire state is covered in poppy fields. My, home, uh, my hometown, Iguala Guerrero, is surrounded by poppy fields. What it has also done for my state is that Guerrero has become the most violent state in Mexico. It has also become a place full of mass graves. I don't know if you guys heard of the 43 students who disappeared in Mexico a few years ago. They disappeared in my hometown. So Iguala Guerrero has become a place so unstable, so violent, that college students like yourselves can disappear overnight and nobody knows where they went, who did it, where are they now? And it's been you know, five years and we still don't have answers. So that's the kind of place that it has become and it's because of this war on drugs. The war on drugs has caused Mexico to become one of the most dangerous countries in the world. It's actually on course to surpass Syria as the most violent country in the world. And last year, there were almost 36,000 homicides in Mexico, and that was a 12% increase from the year before. So this is what's happening because of the war on drugs. And of course, because of this war, last year, five of the 10 most dangerous cities in the world were in Mexico, and three were in Venezuela. So these are just some examples of how the war on drugs has failed, especially in Latin America. But um, the other thing with, with uh, you know, as uh, we're, we're talking a lot about um, asylum seekers and refugees that have been coming recently, um, we don't talk about why they're coming. You know, we don't acknowledge that a lot of these migrants that are coming are trying to get away from drug-related violence, right? And our role in that, creating that instability. So um, this year alone, there has been uh, 500,000 Salvadorians, Guatemalans, Hondurans, who have already left their countries to try to come here and seek asylum. And drug-related violence is one of the factors that contributed to the formations of the migrant caravans which Trump said were an invasion instead of actually calling it what it was, a desperate, um, a, a desperate uh, escape out of this um, violence. So one of the things that people don't know is that the war on drugs has been funded by the United States. You know, the US has sent billions of dollars to these countries, Mexico, to the Central American countries, to Colombia. Um, the US has been sending them all this money. Um, they have been sending um, aircraft and weapons and, and uh, they've been training soldiers down in Latin America. So it's a US funded violence. So when we think about all the people that are escaping that violence, we need to acknowledge our part in creating that. Um, so these are some things that we need to think about when it comes to you know, the, the border walls and when Trump insists that we need a border wall. Here on this side of the border, our Latino communities are not dealing with you know, the cartels, they're not dealing with disappearances or killings, but we are dealing with other situations. We are dealing with things such as um, the way that the drug and wars has been carried out here is that it's criminalized um, drugs, but the ones who pay the price are our Latino communities and our black communities because when Latinos and blacks are caught with drugs, they, they get um, thrown into prison, they get punished. 
if you're an undocumented immigrant, you get deported, right? So the way that Latino family, families are dealing with um, the war on drugs on this side of the border is just how we are held to a double standard than, than white people. And the drug war has increased racial profiling. So with Latinos being disproportionately targeted, uh, we along with blacks are more likely to be criminalized for drug use and possession. Disparities in incarceration rates for drug offenses have led to 80% of people in federal prison and almost 60% of people in state prison being black or Latino. And the immigrant community, uh, as I mentioned, is the most vulnerable. Uh, every year, there are up to 40,000 deportations for minor drug offenses such as possession. So I wanna share a little anecdote with you uh, how I came face to face with this situation in terms of how Latinos are expected to talk about the, the, the drug crisis versus how white people talk about the drug crisis. Um, a few years ago, I participated in a panel that was called Drugs, Art, and Society, along with uh, two other Mexican writers. And the fourth panelist was a visual artist, a white American man. And as we were talking uh, during the panel about, about this um, issue, the, those, the, the three of us Mexicans talked a lot about the drug war, about the violence in our country, the cartels, the killings, and the disappearances in Mexico. But the white artist, he didn't talk about drug addiction and the severe drug epidemic here in this country and how that is fueling the drug crisis. He started talking about a fun project that he was working on which was, um, he was painting self-portraits under a, the influence of a different drug. So up on the projection screen, he started showing us all his self-portraits and saying, oh, with this one, I was under the influence of meth, and with this one, I did marijuana, and with this one, it was this. And it was so much fun, you know, and then he said that, um, Word got around about his art project and people started showing up at his doorstep to give him drugs for free. And as, you know, as I was sitting there on that panel thinking if this was a Mexican immigrant artist who was talking about his drug-induced art projects, he would either find himself in prison or find himself on a bus back to Mexico even before the paint finished drying. And that is just a reality, you know, of how uh, people of color, how Latinos are treated, right? The double standard that I talk about. So this was an experience that I had that to this day, you know, I'm still kind of trying to deal with of how it made me feel as a Mexican talking about um, the, the, the very harsh reality that my community is living with, and then talking about a drug-induced project. So um, going back to the rally that Trump was at when he said uh, Hispanic Americans, they understand they don't want criminals coming over the border, they don't want people taking their jobs, they want to have that security, and they want the wall they want the wall, but as usual, he is wrong. <laughs> In 2018, last year, there was a survey from the Pew Hispanic Research Center that showed that 75% of Latinos oppose the border wall. So I don't know where he gets his numbers from, but we don't want a wall. Uh, we don't want a wall because we understand even if our president doesn't, that a border wall won't keep drugs from entering the country since most of the drugs are coming in through legal points of entry. One of the things he's been saying all the time is how you know we need to seal the borders to keep drugs out. 
but um, even fact checkers have um, shown that the reality is that a lot of these drugs are coming through here legally, smuggled in through um, these ports of entry. And just to give you a, a, um, an idea of how many drugs are getting um, caught at the border as they're coming in, I mean, these are the numbers. You know, this is what Border Patrol has um, confiscated as they, people have tried to smuggle in these drugs through U.S. ports of entry. Americans spend $150 billion annually on marijuana, on cocaine, on heroin. Um, the numbers haven't yet come in for fentanyl, but that is also rising in popularity. So that's something that we also need to think about here. And a border wall is not gonna stop any of this, right? So this is my argument as to why we don't need a border wall. As much as Trump and many people in the US want to point the finger at us Latinos and accusing us of being drug dealers and criminals, what is driving the drug crisis is the drug addiction in the United States. So what I think will finally stop the influx of drugs is for our political leaders to help, out, to help put an end once and for all for, um, to this drug addiction. And that is something that we need to own up to and we need to recognize that no border wall is gonna solve this problem. And we need to stop blaming Latin American countries for this situation because as everybody knows, it's demand that fuels the, the supply, not the other way around. Right, so to me, like I just want to see our political leaders finally like step up and start creating policies that work. You know, policies in education, in healthcare, social policies that are going to help us as a country finally put an end to this drug epidemic and to finally start seeing changes here and seeing changes in Latin America. And, and that is the way we're going to move forward, not by building walls and creating even more and more um, barriers between our communities. So when I was a young girl coming to the United States as a border crosser, one of the things that I realized very quickly about borders is that there aren't just physical borders, you know, there are all kinds of borders. And as an immigrant, you know, when I crossed the border as a child, I thought uh, as we were driving up the five after we made it across on our third attempt, I thought we're done with borders, right? We succeeded, we are here. And then I realized, oh, well, there's more borders, more borders that I'm gonna need to cross. There's of course a physical border, but then there's the language border, there's the cultural border, there's a legal border, there's economic borders, there's education, rent, uh, gender, and career borders. There's all kinds of barriers. The first barrier, the first border that I encounter when I set foot in this country was the language border. Um, my siblings and I, when we arrived here, we didn't speak a word of English. And they started in uh, junior high, and luckily for them, their junior high had an ESL program where they were able to start taking English as a second language, whereas I ended up at an elementary school that was a sink or swim you know, kind of school. They just threw me into an English-only classroom and they expected me to either survive or die in there. Um, when I walked into my classroom and my teacher saw that I didn't speak the language, she pointed to the farthest corner of her classroom and sat me there and then ignored me for the rest of the year. So that was a border that I had to overcome, was that language border. And I sat there in the corner of her classroom just um, feeling invisible, feeling voiceless, and feeling inadequate. 
and then the, those little you know thoughts started to come um, that I wasn't enough that there was something wrong with me and the message that I received from my teacher was that if I wanted to be seen and heard I would have to to learn English as long as I spoke only Spanish I would be ignored and put in a corner and this is the same message that immigrants in general receive from American society. You know, uh, the U.S. does not have an official language, but English reigns supreme, right? We worship it here, and the message that we give to immigrants is that in order for us immigrants to be considered fully American, we must speak English or else we risk being forced to live on the margins of society. And that was a message I received from day one that I started school. So as my siblings and I came of age in California, we struggled to cross that language barrier. Um, for the next four years, we worked really hard to learn how to be American and how to fit in. And no matter what we did, you know, at least for me, I always struggled. I always felt like an outsider and it was difficult to get across that invisible wall that my teacher had put between me and the society that I wanted to belong to. So one of the things that I did to help me get across that barrier was to um, learn English faster, and I did that by reading a lot. I became an avid reader, and I grew up in a home with no books, so I would go to the public library and borrow books and read and read. And I was always reading all the time. My sister can tell you that I used to hide under the covers with the flashlight at night just so I could keep reading. And um, I would go to the public library and borrow books. But soon, even literature became another barrier. And literature became a barrier for me because these are the books that the librarian was handing to me. You know, books like uh, Sweet Valley High, V.C. Anders books, The Babysitter's Club. Then I started reading a lot of YA fiction, and then I, I discovered the cheesy Harlequin romances, and I was reading those too. And literature became a barrier because I never saw myself in books. I was always reading about, you know, these characters with blonde hair and blue eyes and who lived a completely different life than I, than, than I did. But I was fascinated by these books because they gave me access to an America that wasn't mine and it was white middle class America. And that was the only way I could access that was through these books. But um, I started to ask myself, where am I in these books? You know, why don't I exist in literature? And of course, at the time, I didn't know that the publishing industry suffers from a lack of diversity. You know, even just to give you an example, last year, 5% um, of all the books that were published, only 5% of those books featured a Latino character versus 50% which featured white characters. Animals were featured more than a Latino character, with 27% of books featured an, anim an animal character than a Latino. So if the numbers are like this pitiful right now, imagine how they were when I was a young girl, desperate for books where I could see myself and I could not find them. So literature also was a barrier for me that I needed to overcome. And as a teenage girl, I started to write stories. I started to write stories because I realized that I wasn't gonna find myself in the books at the library, that I was gonna have to write my own stories and write my way into existence. And that's when I picked up the pen and I started to write. And I haven't stopped writing since then. And that is what helped me to get across that particular barrier. Um, another barrier that my family and, and I were dealing with was the legal, uh, a legal border because we were undocumented when we arrived. So uh, we were, you know, afraid of deportation. 
um, and we were also afraid of not finding a way, right, to, to obtain legal status and to be allowed to remain here. So the legal border was another thing that we had to deal with. Fortunately for my family, we arrived at a time when um, things were different than they are today. You know, we got here in 1985 when Reagan was president. And as you guys know, Ronald Reagan um, passed an amnesty that forgave three million people, including my father and my mother, for coming into the country illegally. And he allowed three million people to remain here in the United States as legal permanent residents. And to me, like when I think about that moment, like when we came versus all of the other immigrants that have come after us, it makes me really sad because we have not had immigration reform the way we had back in, in 1986 with Reagan. And it's also amazing to me how much things have changed in terms of the Republican Party who now re won't even touch the word amnesty, right? And yet, it, it was them, the Republicans, a Republican president who allow people like my family um, to, to remain here and, and to give us, right, all these opportunities. And um, the day uh, that our green cards arrived in the mail, my father handed us our green cards and said, I've done my part, the rest is up to you. And I took that green card and I ran with it to my American dream, all the way to the university. And for me, this was uh, a really exciting time for me, but it was also a very scary time for me because I was the first person in my family to go to university. And you know, I know there's some here first generation students and it can be very daunting because um, there's no one at home that you can call and say, hey, how do I do this? Help me. You know, you're, you're on your own. And, and it can be a very scary experience. So um, especially for Latino families, you know, higher education is another border that we have to overcome because there's not a lot of us who make it there. Uh, here in California, only 11% of Latino adults have a bachelor's degree, 11%. And, and it's not the lack of drive. It's not because we don't care and we don't value education. It's just that the Latino community doesn't have enough opportunities and we don't have enough structural support to help get us there. So, Higher education is also another border that I had to overcome as a formerly undocumented immigrant, as a first generation university student, as a low income student. I had all the wrong labels and I had all these obstacles in my way to get there. And when I was there as a student, you know, there were challenges that I was faced with because the university I went to, UC Santa Cruz at the time, was not a Hispanic serving institution. Now they have over 30% of their student body is Latino. When I was there, only 13% of us were Latino and not a lot of us were in the creative writing program. So most of the time I was the only Latina in my creative writing classes and I felt that I, I didn't belong there. You know, my, my teachers, instead of critiquing my craft, they would critique my culture. They would critique my immigrant experiences. And I was writing about being a border crosser, I was writing about poverty, family separation, alcoholism, uh, uh, child abuse. And these were, you know, I was writing my reality and a lot of times my teachers would say, Reina, you have such a wild imagination. <laughs> and so there were so many moments when I just felt like dropping out, that maybe I didn't belong in the creative writing program, that maybe I should just go to Chicano studies and be 
with my people in that safe space. But I stayed in the creative writing program because I knew that I needed to claim that space for my community. And I needed to uh, fight for my stories. And, and I needed to um, be able to, to um, push back every time I was made to feel that I didn't belong there at the table. So, um, so it was a struggle to get through, um, through my college years. And eventually, I learned that I had to learn how to celebrate my border um, cross, my, my identity as a border crosser. Because being a border crosser has turned me into more, not less, than who I used to be. I understood that because I was a border crosser, I had become someone who was bilingual, bicultural, and binational. I was twice the person that I used to be. And that is when I reframed my thinking, and instead of being ashamed of being a border crosser, I began to celebrate it. And that is what I do to this day. You know, I continue to celebrate my identity as a border crosser. So um, in 1999, I managed to get across that barrier of higher education when I walked that stage. And I became the first in my family to graduate from university. But today, it makes me really, really excited um, to look at my family and to know how far we've come. Because today, we have um, my brother Carlos has two daughters at the university right now, and my sister Mago, yeah. <laughs> my sister Mago, her two daughters are in college. So my, my niece Alexa is in college. My younger sister Betty has a son in college. So there's five grandes uh, conquering the world and, and working hard to change those numbers. So, um, so it makes me really, really proud of my family and how far we've come, you know, since that day when we ran across the border. So um, this is something that, that, that I celebrate. Um, and here's a picture of when I graduated and my siblings came out and it was one of the happiest days of my life. Um, so, the other border that I wanna share with you is as a writer, you know, I happen to choose a profession where Latinos um, have to struggle for our stories to be heard. The publishing industry is 79% white across the board with 89% of, 82% of editors are white and 89% of book reviewers are, are white and I always call them la migra of the publishing industry because they decide, right, whose story matters and whose story doesn't, who gets across and who doesn't. And as a Latino writer, it was daunting to try to get past the gatekeepers and, and try to uh, reach my dreams of becoming a published writer. And I was lucky enough to find an agent who started sending my work and she helped me try to get across this barrier. And she sent my, my first book to 27 publishers and one by one that rejection started coming in and coming in and coming in. And uh, 26 editors of the 27 said no. And finally, number 27 came back with a yes. So that was the day when I got across that barrier. So this past June, I celebrated my, ter my 13th anniversary as a published writer. And I feel so fortunate to have been able to turn this dream into a reality. And I realized, you know, that through my writing, I was able to transform myself from being an undocumented immigrant to a published author, to somebody who knew that she had a place 
in the world and that I needed to fight to make sure that I claimed that space for me and for my community. And unfortunately, you know, uh, as a Latina, my struggles have not ended every day. Like I'm still experiencing uh, a lot of obstacles, you know, barriers that I still need to overcome. But what gives me a lot of strength, and every time I'm faced with a particular challenge, I always remind myself, Reina, if you can cross the U.S. border at nine years old, you can cross any border. And that is what I tell myself all the time. So what, was, what once used to be something I was ashamed of is now my, my superpower. That is my superpower. I am a border crosser. And I am very proud to be a border crosser. So just to, to, um, to finish my talk, I, I want to encourage us to continue to use the power of language and the power of stories to fight for our community, to speak up for our community, to transform ourselves and our community. I want us to learn how to use our stories and how to use books to create bridges between us and to tear down those border walls that people insist on building and dividing us as a community. So we have to use what we have at hand, our passions, our skills, our words, our dreams, to knock those border walls down. Thank you so much. So now we will have some time for questions. Please raise your hand and Sabrina and I will come to you with the mic. When you're asking a question, please stand up and try to keep your remarks reasonably short. As always, priority will go to students. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, some states have legalized marijuana, which is a key industry in the drug uh, war that goes on between the U.S. and Mexico. So what is your opinion on other industries that, have, uh, that are looking into decriminalization, such as sex work in California and in other states, too, that have like, contributed to um, creating stronger relationships with law enforcement and decriminalization of minorities? Yeah, um, well, I think for a long time, you know, that was, so, that was uh, something that was put on the table a lot, right? To just decriminalize marijuana. And we refused to do it, and so many lives were affected because of it. You know, especially as I mentioned earlier with the Latino community who was, um, is always getting punished and, and thrown into prison uh, because of um, the double standard right, that is applied to us. So something that, that I see, um, we need to come together as a community to really talk about like what is best for the community, what are the pros and cons, right, that, that um, these decisions are gonna cause and create. And when it comes to marijuana, like, you know, before, like in, in Mexico, for example, like they used to grow marijuana all the time, and then when that was legalized, now the prices dropped, so they started planting poppies. And now, like with, with uh, I don't know, if, you know, I mentioned the drug um, fentanyl, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but now that's becoming like even more and more popular. It's a synthetic um, um, opiate. So, so now even the poppy fields, the, the uh, poppies are not as lucrative in Mexico and now they're starting to, to switch. So for us, I think as a country when it comes to like um, the drug crisis and, and substance abuse uh, across the board, we do need to have more conversations and, and really think about what is the best way to handle the situation so that we can save lives. And for me, one of the things is to really decriminalize um, drug abuse because that's why so many people are afraid to ask for help and, and, and seek help because they're afraid of their repercussions. So we need to think about that 
and 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 do it from a, 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 a and from a compassionate way where we can treat everybody you know with dignity and respect and um, and to do what's best for our communities Hi, thank you so much for coming to CMC today and sharing your journey with us. Uh, my name is Julie and I'm a, a first generation student and I really resonated with you when you said you felt pride in being bilingual, bicultural, binational. Uh, and I was wondering how you and your family went about balancing your identities, especially in a society that really marginalized you and made you feel invisible until you fit some kind of conventional norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it is definitely, difficult when you're made to feel like an outcast. And I think for us, like, um, as, as you know, young immigrants growing up in this country, like my siblings and I, we wanted to hold on to our cultural roots and to our mother tongue. And at the same time, we had all this pressure, you know, to assimilate and, and to feel that if we wanted to belong and not be marginalized, like these are some of the sacrifices and compromises that we needed to make. So we started going the other way, you know, learning English, becoming American, um, all of that. And I think it was when I was an adult that then I felt like, uh, where do I belong? You know, do I belong uh, um, as a Mexican or am I American or where, where am I? And here in this country, I've never been fully American because I'm too Mexican. But then when I went to Mexico, I wasn't Mexican enough over there because I was too Americanized. So um, I had this interesting experience where then um, a few years ago I, I went to, to Spain and I was speaking Spanish over there. And the first thing they said to me was, you're Mexican? And I was like, yes, finally I'm Mexican somewhere. <laughs> So now I want to move to Spain, because over there I am a Mexican. And, and over there, like, it was really funny because I felt like I didn't have to prove anything, right? That I didn't have to, like, like uh, prove my loyalty to anybody. And that's something that gets very exhausting here when you're bicultural. Um, it's just that you're constantly being asked to prove, you know, how Mexican are you? How American are you? And, and it just really shouldn't be that way. Like, why, why aren't we allowed to just rotate in and out of both cultures and to represent both cultures? And um, that's something that, that I'm, even to this day, I'm still striving towards. But ultimately, I just have learned, you know, like I mentioned in my talk, that when society tries to make you feel ashamed of something, you turn that into something positive and say, no, I'm not gonna be ashamed of that. I'm gonna own it and turn it into something beautiful. So um, when society, you know, try to make me feel ashamed of being a border crosser, I've turned it around and say, you know what, that's actually my superpower. Yeah. Yes. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, as being a student interested in education reform and trying to find ways to make um, the education system in America more inclusive, what other examples besides having SEL classes in schools would make, um, would make people not from this country feel more inclusive in like school environments and feel as though they have a cultural space to not only get over that language barrier, but also to embrace who they are? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm a really uh, big supporter of bilingual education and bilingual programs. And I really wish that, you know, every single um, K through 12 school was bilingual because I, I, I think it would help so much to change the mentality that we have here in this country of not valuing languages, you know. Um, my, a friend of mine told me a joke, I'll tell you guys a joke because my brother's a big joker too. He's always telling jokes. And my friend says to me, what do you call someone who speaks two languages? Bilingual, right? What do you call someone who speaks many languages? Uh, multilingual, 
why do you call someone who speaks one language? American. American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was like, yes, you know, we need to move away from that one language. Because the, the world, one of the beautiful things about it, the human race is how we have created all of these languages, right? And, and why not celebrate that? And here in this country, we speak 360 languages in the United States. And yet, we're only always worshiping one, right? English above all others. So I would really love to see us moving towards a more um, inclusive society, where we're at, and it begins by us celebrating how multilingual this society is. So I, I support bilingual programs. My daughter is in a bilingual program right now. She, um, she goes to a dual uh, language immersion program, dual um, Spanish immersion. So she gets, every day, she gets half of her um, school in Spanish, the other half in English, every single day. And what I love about the way she's learned languages is that she never had to sacrifice anything, replace anything, subtract anything about herself. You know, she learned um, how to celebrate these, these two languages, these two identities. And, and that, that's what I want to see. So, you know, and let's not just stick to two. Let's, let's have multilingual programs. So that's what I want to see. So I really hope we can make more and more um, changes when it comes to how we teach our children and um, to, to start with the celebration of languages. We have a question in the back. Uh, hi, thank you so much for coming today. Um, Seeing that you published five books, and I want to eventually um, maybe publish videos, or publish videos or publish writing, uh, I was wondering how do you get over that initial fear of publishing something, of like putting your heart or soul into something, uh, knowing that you might piss off some people or that some people might call you a list of I guess slurs or whatever you want to um, imagine. How do you get over that um, initial fear? Yeah, yeah, it ca it can be really scary, you know, when you write stories and you pour your heart and soul into them, like you say, and then um, you send them out into the world and try to get them published. But um, it's very scary, but it's also really empowering, you know, to, to own your story and to, and to be willing to share it with others. And one of the things that I learned, like for example, when The Distance Between Us was published, um, I was really afraid to share my story because, you know, it was a memoir about my family's immigrant experience. And it's not a, a, it was not a romanticized story of the immigrant experience. I mean, if you guys have read the book, you know I'm not romanticizing anything. And so I was afraid of how people were going to judge me and my family, right? Um, and I was a, afraid to make myself so vulnerable like that. But then when the book came out, like, you know, I've had so many people come up to me and say, that's my story. You told my story. And, and to me, that's what really um, made me so happy to know that I overcame that fear of sharing the story because by me sharing my story, then I empowered other people to feel proud of their own story and to see themselves in literature and to see that their stories matter, that they matter. So um, when you think about you know, that fear that you have, like just think about how many lives you're going to touch, how many lives you're going to change, and how many people you're going to empower by sharing your stories with the world. We have another question at the back over here. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. Okay, one sec. I read it all out, okay. Thank you so much for coming to speak to us. First of all, back in the corner over here, we are part of this class that have, we've been reading your memoir, La Fem um, The Distance Between Us, and discussing it. Um, and so we're really, speaking for all of us, we're really grateful that you're here to speak to, and hearing you speak. Yeah, so my question oh, thank you. is, we've read a lot about the cycle of parenting 
and the um, generational patterns that occur often in Latinx families. And I just wanted to ask you, but also to your siblings, Mr. Carlos and Ms. Mago, uh, how have the way that you, your parents have parented you or the way that you grew up influenced the way that you parent your own children? Mm. How much time do I have to <laughs> tell you all my troubles and my issues as a mom? Yeah, I, I've actually been writing a lot more about this because now as a parent, um, it, it's helped me a lot to understand my own parents. And, and I have been thinking a lot about, you know, like how, have, how did my relationship with my own parents affect the way that I parent my own children? And it's definitely, uh, there's a lot of good things and a lot of bad things too, you know, in terms of like me being very, very proactive in terms of breaking um, bad cycles in my family like for example, child abuse, you know, my siblings and I grew up with so much child abuse and that's something that I have tried not to replicate in my own home with my children. Um, my siblings might tell you I like overdo it because I'm, I'm a pushover um, because I, I've gone the other way where instead of being like a strict disciplinarian and authoritarian the way my father was, I kind of go the other way where my children walk all over me. Um, <laughs> and and so, so I'm always like struggling and, it, and it's kind of funny because now with my kids, you know, uh, I'm always thinking like something, sometimes my kids do something and, and I always say, my dad wouldn't put up with that. My dad would never put up with that. And now I'm like, I'm, I'm romanticizing my dad's parenting <laughs> style. Uh, and, and, but, but the reality was that my dad was not a great parent, <laughs> you know, he was so physically abusive and his only form of disciplining was to hit us with his belt and that was it. So with my kids, you know, a, a lot of times I, I, I always go to my husband for help because he grew up in a home where they had, you know, positive reinforcement. <laughs> and I was like, what's that? <laughs> and I'm gonna take away your toy if you don't behave, you know, like. So I, I, I really have very limited imagination when it comes to disciplining and I just wanna go get my chancla, you know? <laughs> so then my husband, like a lot of times he's the one that, that disciplines the kids because he, he does it in a way that I, I just, Hello, uh, Carlos, for everyone. Um, so, great question. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, yes, we had a very harsh father, um, very disciplinarian, as my sister said. Um, but I, I always relate to, um, you have to keep the good and throw the bad away, right? So, a lot of things that I know work, I implemented that. But a lot of things that I knew that either I didn't have, such as uh, affection or support, um, I knew what it felt not to have it. So that I knew that when I had kids, I was gonna make sure that they had it. So that's, um, you know, there's a, there's a saying in Spanish that when, uh, when a tree uh, grows and it grows sideways that you can't change it, but we, we're not trees, and so, <laughs> right, I mean, <laughs> we're not. <laughs> and we have the ability to rationalize, to think, to feel, and so my thinking was that I was gonna make sure that my kids did not go through what I went through. And so that was my approach as far as how I, I, um, I sort of envisioned myself as a parent. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I would like to thank you for being here and giving us this talk. Um, reading your book 
some parts are really difficult to get through and especially because so many immigrants and undocumented students can relate to your story. Um, how do you take all of that, all of those traumatic experiences and create something so beautiful that so many people can resonate with and what was your goal with writing this memoir? What did you want to get out of it? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I, I really do believe that if you don't transform those bad experiences, they're going to transform you, right? So you really do have to like take power over them and, and, and transform them into something beautiful. And one of, one of the, the people that I admire a lot, and, and I know like a lot of us Chicanas, Latinas admire her a lot, is uh, Frida Kahlo. And I admire her because she suffered a lot throughout her life. You know, she was always in pain, in and out of hospitals her whole life. And yet she did not allow that, that pain to, um, to damage her, to damage her core. And instead what she did was she used that pain and transformed it into these beautiful art pieces that now we get to enjoy, right? And, and, that's, and that's something that really inspired me when I discovered her art and when I learned of her story, that it is possible to, to transform your pain and, and to do something with it um, that is good and that, and that is beautiful. And that's what I try to do with my writing, because like my memoirs, I consider them self-portraits. You know, the way Frida painted her self-portraits, I paint self-portraits with words. And, and I, a lot of times, I, I always start from that pain to try to get it out of my body and use it um, as, as, as fuel for, for putting my story out. Um, it has been a, a beautiful gift to have writing in my life. I, I got so lucky, so, so lucky that from an early age, I discovered writing and that I loved writing. I loved how it made me feel um, in every part of my body. I loved how through my writing, I was able to understand things that were happening to me, to come to terms with those things, to learn, um, to see the beauty in what was broken. And, and that has been the greatest gift that life has given me is this writing that I have. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much again for sharing. Um, so at this age, a lot of what is talked about is finding our identity. Um, and you have quite a few um, Chicanos, Latinos here that um, are, you know, we're in a white dominated country. And so I'm just asking you, like, because you have navigated that system and you know that you need to like adapt in certain ways to be able to like get ahead, like, how do you keep like, how do you keep like learning how to do that while like staying really grounded in your identity and simultaneously co combating all of the stereotypes and generalizations? And do you have any like advice for those of us who might be experiencing the same thing? Yes. Um, yeah, being, being your age, you know, it's definitely, and we were just talking to my niece Alexa because she's also your age, you know, young, young woman. Um, trying to discover who she is and it's just it's it's a it's a beautiful moment in your lives but it's definitely a very scary moment too because you are still um, trying to to find yourself and to figure out like you know what kind of person do you want to be um, and and trying to 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 claim that space you know in this world and and to to really figure out like what is it that you want out of life? Um, how do you see yourself? Who do, uh, who do you see yourself being in you know, 15, 20, 30 years from now? And so it's, it's really scary about what the future um, might be, but it's also a really exciting time because you get to create that future. That future is a work in progress. You know, your past is already past. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't change anything. You, so stop regretting anything. 
just look towards the future because that's what still has all the potential. You know, it's, 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 um, you still, you have that power to create the future for yourself that you want. And ultimately, you know, people can give you advice and they can tell you how to do this, how to do that, but you're the one on the, on the driver's seat. You get to decide, you know, where you wanna go, what path you wanna take. And this is your life. Um, so make sure that, that you own it and that, and that you live up to your own expectations, not anybody else's expectations. Hi, thank you so much for coming to CMC and sharing your story. Um, so my question was regarding, like, do you think being a woman has shaped your immigration and writing experience differently? Because I know oftentimes women who cross the border face higher rates of sexual assault and like mm -hmm. other very unfortunate experiences, mm -hmm. but the publishing, publishing industry is mainly female dominated, but it lacks um, racial diversity. So how do you, yeah. how is that dynamic? Yeah, thank you, thank you for that question. Uh, and thanks for bringing up about the reality that female immigrants face, you know, because definitely um, you hear all these stories about uh, female migrants getting, you know, raped at the border and, and uh, many of them, you know, um, they start taking birth control from when they, before they embark on their journeys just because they already take it, you know, they, they know that something's gonna happen to them along the way. Um, we were really fortunate because when we crossed the border as children, my father was with us. And I consider that as being very fortunate because there's so many children in our situation who make the journey alone or with strangers, right, who can hurt them uh, along the way but my father was with us and he took care of us. And so I always felt protected uh, as, a, as, a, as a young girl. Like I didn't have that fear of like, oh, you know, I'm gonna get raped here um, because my father was with us and he took care of us. Another thing that I really loved about my father, you know, he had a lot of flaws, but the one thing I love about my dad was that he treated my sister and me equally and as, as equally as my brother. He, he didn't give me a complex for being a girl. He never made me feel that I was inferior because I was a girl or that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't achieve uh, what my brother could achieve because I was a girl. Um, as far as I know, like, we weren't, like, cooking for him and, and ironing his clothes and, you know, like, a lot of Latina girls are made to, cater to their brothers like that and be like mates to their brothers and then we were not treated like that at home. So I did not grow up with the, com with the complex about being a girl and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I think that, that that has also helped me, you know, in terms of overcoming like all these different obstacles is that to me, my, my experience has usually been more about, about my Latino identity, um, and, and I have not like, had to worry too much about my insecurities as a, as a woman. And even in the publishing industry, like it's been whatever challenges I have faced, it has more to do about being Latino, not so much about, about being a woman. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Please join me in thanking Rena Grande for her at all. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.